Well, a very warm welcome tonight as we come and worship the Lord. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, uh, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it's of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered, once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Well, may the Lord seal the truth of his word in our hearts tonight. I'd like to take as a text um, the verses that we read in the uh, last part of that passage in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 26 and 28. But now once in the end of the world... Hath he, that's Christ, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. What a marvellous prospect that is. And it's a pleasure, isn't it, to read these words of comfort in these darkening days. It's wonderful that we can take God's word. We're, we're living in a time, aren't we, of much uh, misinformation, um, untruth, disinformation, propaganda, all sorts of things, slants, influences, all sorts of things that would take us away, really, from the truth. 
And of course, we know that the truth is embodied in none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who said, I am the way, the truth. He's saying, in effect, I am the truth. Hallelujah. And indeed, uh, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There is only one way. And of course, as our brother was speaking earlier about the aspect of standing firm in the things of the Lord, that's the one point that no man comes to the Father except through Jesus that is um, under attack in these days with uh, multi-faith, etc., etc. Anyway, I'd like to talk tonight about sacrifice. Sacrifice. Jesus here in Hebrews chapter 9, 26 says that he has appeared, Jesus has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Sacrifice. Looking for a definition here. And uh, we can use it as a verb, like to sacrifice. That's to give up something that's valuable to you in order to help another person. Uh, of course, in the wider, or, or sorry, in, in the biblical sense, it's to kill an animal or a... Um, but, uh, <laughs> hmm, I was going to say, or a person. We could, the only person I believe who was killed as a sacrifice is indeed the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible. Anyway, um, as I say, there's the aspect to kill an animal of sacrifice and offer them to a god or gods. Well, of course, in the biblical sense, Jesus is the one true sacrifice and he is the one who offered himself. to. In fact, that's the reason why he came into this world, to offer himself back to his father as a sacrifice on behalf of us. We're the ones, mankind, that benefits this is encapsulated, of course, in the gospel in a nutshell, isn't it? That uh, God so loved the world, that's the Father loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, that's Jesus, that whosoever believes in him, that's Jesus, believes in Jesus, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. So, sacrifice can be used as a doing word, a verb, to sacrifice, but also can be used as a noun, a something. So, again, a sacrifice is something offered. Um, could be an object, or we were talking about animals, or even a person here. Uh, something destroyed or surrendered for the sake or benefit of something else, or somebody else. Um, something given up or lost. So there we have then some idea of what a sacrifice is then. Um, it's cost something, but to uh, the person who benefits from it, it doesn't, as it were, because someone has given up or paid the price on behalf of someone else. I remember years ago, uh, we had some uh, Gideon um, uh, people uh, who organised a rally in Winslow, and the, the famous speaker, I think he was a rheumatologist from Leeds University, Dr. Werner Wright. I don't know whether that name rings a bell with anybody. Werner Wright? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, he came to Winslow and he was talking about sacrifice then. We're talking about decades ago, actually. He talked about a lamb for a man. And of course, there we have it with Abel, a lamb for a man. And then we have a lamb for a family or a household. Of course, that was in Moses' day, Passover lamb. And then we have a lamb for a nation. We know that on the Day of Atonement, the uh, Yom Kippur, the high priest, went into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the lamb there, the lamb for a nation. And then finally, of course, we have the Lord Jesus Christ himself, a lamb for mankind. A lamb for a man, a lamb for a family, a lamb for a nation, and a lamb for mankind. And when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ sacrificing himself, we have this aspect of atonement. So a funny word this, because it's mainly used in the scripture. I don't know whether it's um, used anywhere else. 
but it's the reconciliation of God and man. In other words, it's the coming back together again. And the only way that that can happen, of course, is through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ himself. And we think about this atonement as being a substitutionary sacrifice. In other words, it's a sacrifice on behalf of. And that would be, in the case of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, it would be on behalf of us who believe on him. Hallelujah. So, substitutionary sacrifice. We're living in tumultuous times in the geopolitical sphere. It's mentioned about the elections in the America, the US, uh, coming up this week. Uh, we also have the uh, current uh, Israel war being fought physically on several fronts. We also have the criticism of the UN and the uh, Western nations um, levelling this criticism at Israel rather than at her aggressors. We very rarely hear anything against Hamas or against Hezbollah or against um, Iran and various other enemies that are coming against Israel, but it's always that Israel has done this or created this atrocity or whatever. It's interesting, Howard Bass from Beersheba recently wrote, and he put it this way, Israel is being thrown under the bus just as we threw Yeshua outside his vineyard and insisted that he be crucified. This was and is part of God's sovereign love, plan, righteousness and wisdom so that salvation can come to the whomsoever. And it's the whomsoever will repent and believe the good news. Some uh, Christianized nations and people think that it is good that one country and people be sacrificed rather than the whole Western world be destroyed. Uh, this was a false assumption by the Jewish leadership in Yeshua's day, though it was necessary for God's purpose and the scriptures to be fulfilled. And Rome did destroy the Jewish nation and land, but Islam is the beast that is exceedingly dreadful and unlike any of the previous beasts. Everyone, including all the nations, is terrified by this beast. It revives with a vengeance, making war against Jews, Christians and lukewarm Muslims. Jews and Christians in the Western world are witnesses to the one true God, whom the devil and his beast kingdom hate with an unrelenting passion. The same spirit that satanically insisted on Messiah's crucifixion is the same spirit at work today to destroy the very people whom the father calls his firstborn son. It's in Exodus 4. Uh, the heir to collectively be his priestly nation in the coming kingdom. Well, I think we can see something of that uh, aspect that um, really this, uh, the whole aspect of a two-state solution is indeed this sacrifice that's being talked about with by Howard Bass here, I believe. So, continuing then the theme of substitutionary sacrifice, uh, let's look at what happened to our Lord Jesus Christ. After the miraculous restoration of life to Lazarus, we read about this in John 11, um, we can pick up the account um, of the reaction of the Jews. Jesus had raised Lazarus to life again, hallelujah, and there was a reaction amongst the people around there. So John's Gospel, chapter 11, you're welcome to follow it with me from verse 45, and we pick it up with verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary, that's of course Lazarus' his sister, and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. 
Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and will take away both our place and our nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, uh, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And we pick up then in John 18, verse 13, and they led him away, that's Jesus being led away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So here we have then, even at uh, the trial of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that was in uh, John 18, of course. Um, but before that, <laughs> the plotting started, didn't it? even after the raising of Lazarus, it was expedient that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. That is substitutionary sacrifice there that Caiaphas is talking about. Um, I've got a, a, a comment here by L.M. Grant about the further plotting of the Jews against him, that's against Jesus. Many of the Jews could not but be brought to believe in Jesus or in him after such things. On the other hand, some currying favour of the religious leaders report to the Pharisees what the Lord has done. These, with the chief priests, become more deeply alarmed rather than deeply impressed and gather a council to consider how they may silence one who, as they admit, does many miracles. The pride of their own position was in jeopardy. They were well able to disguise their motives with a foolish suggestion that if they let him alone, it would lead to the Romans taking the Jews captive. Their reasoning is that he would become a leader who would challenge the authority of Rome, but they knew well that there was no slightest indication of political aspirations on Jesus' part. In fact, their not leaving him alone but crucifying him led to the very thing they claimed to fear. Selfish pride, as seen in the expression, our place and nation, was the means of defeating its own end. Caiaphas, we're told, was high priest that year. Herod has set up and deposed the high priest to suit himself at any time. Of course, a contradiction to God's original appointment. It was God who appointed the high priest through the Levitical tribe. Evidently inflated with the pride of his own position, Caiaphas haughtily de declares the ignorance of his cohorts and indicates his superior wisdom in finding some justification in their murdering the Lord Jesus. One man, he says, should die for the people. Verses 49-50. Uh, behind these words, then, of course, was subtle wickedness. But here is a striking illustration of how God can use the evil of man and have him speak words which have a far higher meaning than the man himself intends. Christ's death would not save Israel from being scattered and decimated at that time, but it would accomplish a greater end. Therefore, though it was with wicked motives that Caiaphas spoke of one man dying for the people, yet God, in allowing him to speak, had higher thoughts in these very words. Words, too, which are applied not only to Jews, but to Gentile believers scattered abroad. For the death of Christ was the means of gathering them together in one. This is verses 51, 52. Though Caiaphas would have resented the very thought of such gathering together. 
The Jews then are easily persuaded that it is right to put Christ to death, for they have the plausible excuse of trying to save their nation. They agree in plotting his murder. Still, his hour has not come. He withdrew to a city called Ephraim, to the north and east, on the edge of the desert, verse 54, and in spite of all these occasions in which the Pharisees were frustrated in their efforts to arrest him, they seem blinded to the significance of this fact. In fact, they did not take him at God's time. It was a time when they had planned not to do so. So that was LM's uh, uh, take on that aspect of the plotting and the various sort of undercurrents and overtones and so forth that, that was in that um, situation. So interestingly enough, later on in, in Jesus' trial, his sacrifice is confirmed and compounded by the very possibility of him being released. Matthew 27, again, I'd like to read the scriptures here because I think it's telling here. So on the one hand, you have the uh, Pharisees and the religious authorities baying, as it were, for Jesus' blood. But then, on the other hand, at the trial, you have the um, civil authorities uh, nearly releasing Jesus, nearly. We pick it up at verse 15 of Matthew 27. Now, at the feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I've suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the twain will you that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas! Pilate saith unto them, What shall I then do with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. I think that very saying has been a damnation to the Jews ever since. They said, His blood be on us and on our children. Verse 26, then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. I think there you can see how very, very close Jesus came to being released as far as the civil uh, authorities concerned, the governor. But the religious authorities have stirred up the people. And uh, in the so-called democratic process where the majority... Uh, seems to carry the day. Jesus indeed was crucified. And so Jesus is demonstrating as completing what John the Baptist proclaimed. John 1, 29. Behold, this is what John the Baptist said. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So Jesus is the supreme sacrifice substitutionary in as far as it is us, you and me, who deserve to die. But no, our sin was laid on Jesus and we go free, just as Barabbas went free. He didn't deserve to be released, 
he was guilty of murder. So I'd like to just close with some points which might illustrate the way in which we can consider this aspect of sacrifice in a personal way. And of course, that is to do with prayer. Um, again, these are verses from scripture that I'm bringing out. Let my prayer, this is Psalm 141, two, verse 2. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. This is the sacrifice of prayer. We also have in Psalm 107, verse 22, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Hallelujah. And back in Hebrews 13 this time. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Hallelujah. Going on then to this aspect of devotedness. Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This aspect then of being a living sacrifice, being devoted to God. Hallelujah. Benevolence, that's something, of course, that benefits someone. And there is a sacrifice in that, isn't there? Indeed, Philippians 4 exhorts us. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. And here the Apostle Paul calls that um, whatever was sent as being a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And uh, also the writer of Hebrews says in, in chapter 13 again, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Quickly going on then to uh, righteousness, Psalm 4. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Indeed, even a broken spirit is the sacrifice. Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, God O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Again, this is, we're looking here at uh, what is acceptable to Almighty God as a sacrifice. And of course, we could talk about martyrdom as well, which is found in Philippians 2, verse 7. Um, indeed, this is the Lord himself. Made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And indeed, the apostle uh, writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 6 says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. He was offering himself, wasn't he? And realising that uh, he was a giving of himself, indeed, to the Lord. Hallelujah. So we come to a close, and as we recognise then, a need uh, of sacrifice not only do we need to benefit from the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us a sweet offering hallelujah but also that we ourselves in response not that we in doing anything can uh, obtain salvation it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that has obtained our salvation hallelujah the, 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 for without remission of um, Without the sacrifice of blood, there is no remission of sins. Hallelujah. But once we are a believer, once we are a Christian, once we are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the disciple, then sacrifice is very much in the situation of our lifestyle, our ambitions, our aspirations. We should be looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's then close with the text then. Hebrews 9, 26 and 28. But now 
Once in the end of the world has he, Christ, appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming again. That's one of the marvellous associations we have with Chartridge, of course, these quarterly meetings that we've had over the years with the Prophetic Witness Movement International, which emphasises and focuses on the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming again, and we, we uh, thank the Lord for Chartridge and uh, helping us in that respect. I want to just leave with you then this aspect of Jesus being uh, in, indeed of himself, sacrificing himself uh, for us. Sacrifice of himself is our thoughts tonight, and may the Lord bless them to you. Amen. Amen.